Tito, one o'clock block, one o'clock rock. We're here on Think Tech Life in the Law. We are honored, truly honored to have with us Evelyn Lance, retired lawyer and judge of the first of the family court of the First Circuit. Correct. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the show, Evelyn. My great pleasure. Let me talk about you for a minute. Uh, you were admitted to the bar in the state of Hawaii in 1974. You were appointed to the family court in 1980. Um, and you were on the disciplinary commission uh, of the Bar Association for 12 years, and you recently just got off that, 12 years just recently. Correction, it's the disciplinary board of the Supreme Court. Pardon me, okay, <laughs> very important. And you have been active in the, a this is really defining now, you've been active in the ABA Rule of Law Project, uh, where you started out by spending one year in Macedonia, and then you've had various trips and experiences all over the world, um, you know, finding out about the rule of law and trying to create awareness about the rule of law, the most important thing really in our time to bring the world up to that level. What a great career you had. Well, I think this goes to the subject of this program, which is life in the law. And while the first responsibility of every attorney is to do best to represent his or her clients and uh, follow the code of professional responsibility. Uh, there are broader ways in which you can contribute, and for me that was uh, an opportunity a few years after I retired and after my husband had passed away and my children left the house. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, about 1990, the American Bar Association developed a project which was then called CELI, Central European uh, Law Initiative, and uh, to try to uh, improve ju ju justice systems and judicial independence in the so-called emerging democracies at that time, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, Central Asia, and I had an opportunity to uh, do some work there and had about 10 years of wonderful experiences meeting real people all over the world other than American tourists and hopefully planting a few seeds. That's the way to travel and the real mission. So in, in the, in the uh, Macedonian experience, the, the shots had already been fired. And you were, we're not in a war zone per se, but it was like after the war zone, yeah. Well, uh, Macedonia itself was never really a war zone. At, at one side, this is border with Serbia, in the north with Kosovo, and on the west, Albania, and the south, Greece. But we arrived just after the Kosovo bombing had stopped. And the capital of Prish, uh, capital Pristina of Kosovo was only about 40 miles from the capital of Macedonia, Skopje. So we were getting all the refugees and a lot of uh, aid organizations from all over the world, Europe, Japan, and it was a just a fascinating, wonderful, incredible time. Wh why did you do it? Uh, that's a good question. I was ready for something new to fill some gaps in my life. I've always enjoyed travel. Uh, we lived abroad for a short time earlier, and it sounded something that would really be enjoyable as well as rewarding. And it was. It was. It was a great 10 years. 10 years. So what did you do in the project? I mean, what was your day like? What kind of functions did you perform? Who did you deal with? What did you achieve? Okay, I can't give you a short answer on that. I know. Uh, uh, the ABA started this project in about 1990 and established offices in these countries. And by the time I got to Macedonia, I think it had been going about five years, we had three, we were called liaisons. We had three American volunteer liaisons. My project was uh, working with the Judges Association. They had a very active Judges Association uh, and the leaders of that association really wanted to improve how they worked, how they could gain more public respect. Uh, it was a transition from the Soviet system where a minister might call them up and tell them how to decide, decide a case. It was called telephone justice. Mm. Uh, worked with the Bar Association uh, on uh, sustainability. Uh, they were having some major corruption problems. Uh, it was not supervised by the Supreme Court as it is here. Uh, worked with uh, the law school. We brought in uh, some uh, visiting p 
people from the U.S. to help them establish clinical law, legal education because the system was so theoretical. I worked with a uh, domestic violence NGO that was uh, lobbying to get a domestic violence law passed, and we did a lot of public education. did a whole lot of stuff. It was great fun. So is it sort of a, um, an arbitrage of ideas, uh, say, you know, what we know, what we aspire to in the U.S.? as against the problems they had there or wherever you were uh, to try to consult with them and show them a better way? I think we did not want to say we want to show you how the U.S. does it. It was international principles. We looked at a lot of international documents and conventions that uh, I had as an American, I had never known existed. I didn't know the difference between the European Commission, the you had to prepare for this. You had to educate yourself. I educated myself when I got there. Yeah. But it used to infuriate me when Justice Scalia would talk about how international law doesn't apply in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to be considered as, uh, as president either, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, very interesting. So, and so now aside from uh, Macedonia and Kosovo and all that, wh where else did you serve? Well, I did, uh, I was in Russia for three months. I've been to the, the Stans, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, one of the most, perhaps the most exciting thing that we did in 2005, we held a conference in Amman, Jordan for uh, Arab women lawyers and judges. They started with judges, but they weren't enough, and it expanded to lawyers. <laughs> what a fortuitous, I think. Yeah. We had two or three delegates from each of 14 Middle Eastern and North African Arab countries. Uh, Tony Blair's wife, Sherry Booth, the human rights lawyer, was our uh, keynote speaker. Great. And this was the first time these women had ever had a chance to talk to each other. And there was a great spread. Morocco had 500 out of 3,000 of their judges were women. Saudi Arabia, women were not even allowed to take the bar examination. And we had two we'll lovely drive. young women who had <laughs> graduated from the law faculty of their university and were working in male law firms interviewing the female clients that the male lawyers weren't allowed to interview. <laughs> so it was, but it was, uh, it, they formed an organization and they had annual meetings for a while and then it kind of faded. Mm. Yeah. You went to Nepal? I was in Nepal at a time when uh, this was about 2009 when the Maoist rebellion had, the, 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 there were several Maoist organizations, but the most uh, extreme one had uh, uh, stopped their revolution or were stopped. And they had a constituent assembly whose task was to uh, draft a constitution. And they had a year to do it, but they still haven't finished it. <laughs> but uh, my part of it was to help them with provisions in the constitution that relate to judicial independence. And some of these people had no more than a third grade education. And I remembered someone saying that, uh, well, the way to have uh, an independent judiciary was to have judges elected so they would be responsible to the people. And this has always been a big issue in the United States as well, of course, because we have so many elected judges. And while I was there, I remember looking at my computer and uh, there was a United States Supreme Court case which was decided while I was there and it was called Caperton versus Massey. Uh, Mr. Massey was the CEO of the famous Massey Mines, which had had numerous disasters and, and was finally closed down recently. But a plaintiff had brought a wrongful death action against the Massey Mines and won in the trial court. And then uh, the uh, defendant, Massey Corporation, appealed to the West Virginia Supreme Court. In the meantime, one of the liberal Supreme Court justice was retiring, and Mr. Massey put $2 million into the campaign of his chosen candidate, and the Supreme Court then reversed the trial court decision. So members of the Supreme Court were elected by popular vote? 
Yes. Well, that's a lot really, of states still yeah, have that's that. That's really something. But uh, the interesting thing was uh, the uh, plaintiff had a clever lawyer because in appealing to the Supreme Court and ultimately United States Supreme Court, they argued that the plaintiff had been denied his due process of law during the appeal because uh, the, the justice had not recused himself. Yeah. And believe it or not, the Supreme Court ruled in this plaintiff's favor and said if it smells like a duck and quacks like a duck. I thought this case would make great news all over the United yeah, States yeah, and it, it died up. in about a day. Yeah, yeah. But, but that does, in fact, legally have a, 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 it's an exciting precedent when you're dealing with election of judges. It, it undermines, and that's a good thing, uh, this notion of election of judges. Well, I think so, and I think uh, in Hawaii we feel very fortunate we don't have it. I think there's still about 33 states that do elect judges at least at some point in the system. Uh, sometimes they're appointed, but then have to run for election for retention. Why don't you tell the people why it's a problem to elect judges? What are the, what are the, the dark sides of that? Well, you know, I think if we had judicial elections here in Hawaii, uh, it would be very difficult as much as a, tr a judge tried to distance himself or herself from the campaign, not to think that when a case came up against you in which Bank of Hawaii or First Hawaiian Bank or Hawaiian Electric was a client, that there had not been a contribution to your campaign. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and there's the appearance judgment. of, you know, it's so yeah. important in judicial conduct and, and in the, uh, in the uh, codes of judicial conduct is that actual impropriety is not the only impropriety. There has to be an appearance of propriety and any appearance otherwise has to be avoided. Yeah. Right? And that's the center really of this part of our discussion, isn't it, Evelyn? It's um, it, the duty of, of the lawyer to build public confidence in the system. Because one of the firmest pillars of the administration of justice is public confidence. And it's very important for lawyers to do whatever they need to do, whatever they have to do, to build confidence, and judges too, in the system. And one of the things that uh, we did in several of the places I worked was to uh, put together a conference of judges and the media. Because the judges, a lot of them had no uh, understanding that their courtrooms were public and that anybody could watch a trial and uh, you know when the uh, media said anything the least bit questionable about them uh, there were threats of lawsuits <laughs> what else is new right well, especially now uh, these days <laughs> but uh, we we try to show that by having an open courtroom and uh, having a judiciary spokesperson which could uh, give information to the media that the it would be to the judge's benefit because if they can show people the reasons why they are deciding a case, uh, that there will be more public trust and that will benefit the whole system. Transparency. And benefit the, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but can you carry it too far? I mean, for example, what do you think about videotaping proceedings in courts? I haven't had any experience with it. I think we, it wouldn't happen in family court here, so I That's don't personal. really. I think it's a personal dispute. Yeah, yeah, I think there are uh, cases where uh, there's a lot of public interest and 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 public uh, a public right to know, and those two are not always consistent, as the. Uh, 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 Sure. I've forgotten well, his name, the, 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 the boxer who murdered his wife. <laughs> oh, uh, Simpson. Simpson. O.J. Simpson, Simpson, Simpson yeah. football player, excuse me. Uh, I, I, there are cases that it might be appropriate, for example, if there's a constitutional issue or an issue about international dealings or something like that. But I don't have a firm opinion on it. Yeah, okay. Well, it's really interesting. But the general idea is that in a lawyer's daily practice, taking clients, taking causes, advancing positions, making arguments. Um, he should keep that in mind, don't you think? It's not an ethical thing. It's um, a trying to see yourself um, as um, an emissary of the government to the public. You're the connection between the government and the public and how the public feels about the government. And if you, you know, diminish um, the quality of the government in the eyes of the public, you're diminishing the system 
um, and you're undermining, you know, the, the, this, the, the holy sacred con compact between the public and the Constitution. Huh? And I think the uh, uh, rules in our Hawaii Code of Professional Responsibility, which pretty much follows the ABA model code, they emphasize that. If you look at the rules on conflict of interest and uh, even rules on trust accounting and all those things. And yeah. So you would agree with me that it goes beyond strictly uh, compliance with ethical standards. It is more of like um, uh, and it's it's ethical standards and an appearance that ethical standards have been complied with. I think that yeah, yeah. That we, we are doing the right yeah. thing. We are doing the right thing for the country, for the people. We're noble and idealistic, that sort of thing. And sometimes uh, lawyers do have a dilemma as to uh, when the personal interest of the client may not be the same as the public interest, and it may not be anything which is a law violation, but then that lawyer has to think that through. I remember a short, uh, a short story. I remember a, a piece on TV, it might have been 60 Minutes or one of those kinds of programs, and um, uh, they had hidden cameras, and uh, they were, the, the, the pe people who set the program up, they were going to various lawyers in lower Manhattan, and they were, um, you know, trying to get the lawyer to take the case, and the case was money laundering. It was, a, it was a, a, an attempt to get the lawyer to represent somebody who, who um, pretty much presented as someone who wanted to launder money. And, there were, and most of them, by the way, this is not good, most of them agreed to take the case or uh, provided advice, and some of their advice was pretty, pretty mm, uh, 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 sleazy. One lawyer, one lawyer, uh, an older gentleman, a solo practitioner in lower Manhattan, they came in, they presented, and he said, I'm not going to do that. Good for him. And, and you're out of my office. Goodbye. Well, We're not going to talk anymore. Well, you know, I think the, the code is clear that a lawyer may not uh, be involved in a client who is going to uh, via, violate the law in future as to representation of somebody who did launder money but is now longer no longer doing it. That's a personal dilemma for the lawyer, I think, yeah. you, and that's what you're talking about. Yeah, and it's something that, you know, you may, you, it may be a very gray area in a given case, it probably is a gray area in a lot of cases, but at least it's something the lawyer ought to think about, because he's part of a process, he is the agent of the government, in a sense, part of the government, and he needs to keep that in mind, because his conduct is going to shape our society. Yeah. Uh, on that note, <laughs> We're going to take a short break. Okay. That's uh, retired Judge Evelyn Lance. We're going to come back and talk some more about this. We're going to talk about, um, you know, the, uh, the international aspect and international or national and international organizations that lawyers might see fit to join and support, again, because of the duties of a lawyer that go beyond just practice. We'll be right back. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kawilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Join me every other Monday when we bring lawyers who know how to get across the sea to meet people and resolve problems into your house. Thank you. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Okay, we're back. We're live. Life in the law with retired judge Evelyn Lance, who's done many, many things in her career, many admirable things in, in a number of places and especially in Hawaii. And, and one of the things, um, you know, is, uh, is, is focus on the duty of a lawyer as a member of, um, you know, the profession, as a representative of the government 
uh, as a special, mm, special person in the community, uh, his duty or her duty beyond just practicing, just representing clientele. I think it's especially important now because um, we have to build confidence. I mean, I, I think clearly what happened in this recent election is a lot of people are not confident about the government. That was revealed if we didn't know it already. And now it's time to look at exactly how you do that. And one of the ways you do it is you, you belong to our society, our community, and you've done that. So I'm interested in the kinds of organizations, the kinds of activities, Evelyn, that you feel are appropriate for lawyers to participate in that go beyond just representing clients. I love to talk about that. <laughs> uh, but, but just briefly, I, you, you mentioned the lawyers do to represent the government, and I think you meant that in a sense of in increasing trust in the government. Yes, but there are I do. times when the lawyer has to perhaps not go represent against the government. The sure, government. So, sure. uh, one of the organizations that I've supported uh, for several years, and if I were about 20 years younger, I might go to Montgomery, Alabama right now and say, here I am, how can I help, is the Southern Poverty Law Center. And uh, they were created and founded in 1971 and started uh, pursuing hate groups and particularly the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, in 1987, uh, the SPLC filed a wrongful death suit against the Ku Klux Klan in a particularly gruesome lynching of a young man uh, in Alabama and won a $7 million verdict by jury and was able to execute that judgment by having the Klan ordered to transfer their main organizational headquarters property to the mother of the young man who was killed. And since then, they've continued uh, their activities. Uh, their website, by the way, is splcenter.org. And uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah. yeah. They uh, publish a quarterly newsletter in which they, and this is all on their website, in which they uh, list the number of, head, of uh, hate crimes that are happening in each state. They uh, keep uh, prosecuting a lot of these people. Uh, they have a hate map, and they have been reporting an increase not only in hate crimes in the last six months, but in the num number of organizations oh, sorry to hear. that are doing this Sounds sort of like stuff. Sounds like So they are a wonderful organization, and uh, uh, you know, what they, they need volunteers, they need money, all those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you a short story again, if you don't mind. Um, I was in the Coast Guard, you know, and when I, I was transferred from Hawaii to New York City, and my boss in New York City, a wonderful man, uh, his name is George Weller, and uh, he was a senior officer. My, my boss is a lawyer officer. And when I, got to, uh, when I got to New York, I found that he wasn't there. He was actually in jail because he had been on a freedom ride in Alabama, and, <laughs> and they didn't care much that he was in the Coast Guard. Um, they just arrested him, and, and he had to spend some of his leave time in jail in Alabama. And when he came back, that's when I met him. <laughs> and he explained to me that as far as he was concerned, this was part of his duty as a professional, as a lawyer. They had to do the right thing, and they had to advance these, uh, you know, these causes and these interests. I found it quite remarkable. The year was 1968. You can imagine how high feelings were running then. <laughs> well, uh, I remember it must have been in the late 80s or early 90s, uh, in one of the annual Bar Association luncheons here, the guest speaker was Morris Deese, who was the uh, person who started the Southern Poverty Law Center. And he talked about exactly what we're talking about, <laughs> about the whole life in the law and how it involves well organizations like yeah. SPLC. Yeah. So there are many organizations that you can join as a lawyer that have nothing to do with your practice. They don't earn you a farthing. They probably cost you money to spend your time with them. On the other hand, it's, it, it's, it's part of life in the law. And, and you've, you've been a, a clear model in that regard. You, for example, you have participated over years and years uh, in the arts here in Hawaii, in the, in the Hawaii Opera Theater. Can we talk about that? Well, uh, you joined me in that. You were on the board for a time as well. I've been on the board for about 35 years. But to me, uh, 
the arts, whether it's the visual arts or the performing arts, round out our lives. And it has been established that children's activity in music and the arts is so important in uh, building their, the way their brain works and, and in uh, making them feel a part of the larger community. And Hawaii Opera, while uh, in the 35 years or so that I've been involved, I've seen the artistic quality of the main productions increase fantastically. We just did a wonderful traditional La Boheme in October. Uh, but there's also an extensive education program. And the education programs of HOT reach about 22,000 school children. And there's a particular uh, project called the Opera Residency in which three or four elementary schools every year are chosen. HOT education staff goes in and works with the kids. And they, the kids produce an opera, about a one hour version of a traditional opera. They do everything, they build sets, they make costumes. Uh, a two, uh, two or three elementary schools are now writing their own operas. Why Kelly wow. was the first wow. one. And the kids write the story and the poetry for the, the songs, the aria, and then the HOT staff will find some operatic music that, that suits that particular vibe. And it, it's a wonderful thing. They even do learn how to do development by going out perhaps and asking local merchants by contributing something for the sets or, or the costumes. Uh, HOT is uh, trying to expand its reach to other parts of the community. So for example, the opera which comes up at the end of January is uh, an opera written by Andre Previn, American composer and conductor, uh, based on Tennessee Williams' play, A Streetcar Named Desire. I think that'll be fabulous. Well, that keeps the art form alive, doesn't it? Exactly. It's not just rooted exactly. in the 19th century. And uh, uh, I don't know, when I come home and feel troubled, I turn on music and it yeah. does it for me. Yeah, and it does it for other people. And, and a, a great gift to a child is to show him or her that you can have the joy of music. You can have the, you know, I go to the opera and invariably in La Boheme, oh, it's an emotional experience for me. I can't, I can't help myself. And I want kids to know that, how that works. My, my children have these musical genes and they've been expressed in other ways. I have uh, a son and grandson who do a lot of rock. I have another son who's a blues guitarist, but it's all music and it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. and it's good for our community. And if we want to build the kind of community that will be sustainable in the future, that will come together, that will be at a, a level um, that we, that we, we want, um, then we have to teach them music, we have to teach them togetherness, we have to, the lawyers have to get out there and do these things. I know you've been involved in a number of charities, and um, I, I admire you so much, Evelyn, for that. Well, thank you. But I think that uh, this, this is part of life in the law also, because when you contribute to the larger community in any way at all, uh, you are contributing to a community that can have public involvement and operate by rule of law. Yeah, that's what we do together, and it makes our society better, and the lawyers must, should be involved. You've been involved, and I think that's great. I think every lawyer should be involved just that way, whether it's part of his practice or not. we got to go now. We're out of time. That's retired Judge Evelyn Lance, uh, who's done some wonderful things. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you show. so much, Jay, for having me. Oh.